So you know who Gene Roddenberry hated? God. Okay, that's a bit of an oversimplification. Roddenberry considered himself a humanist, viewed religion as a form of superstition, and regarded organized religion with particular suspicion, but he also said in one of his final interviews that he did believe in a kind of God. He accepted the notion of God. Perhaps not surprisingly, Roddenberry's most enduring creation has, over the years, reflected his complex views on the subject. We're going to explore that subject in this video as we seek to answer the question, what does Star Trek actually say about religion? Got to the title card early this time. That's a good sign. Hopefully. Let's say it is. There's a widely held perception that there is no religion in Star Trek. However, much like widely held perceptions about other aspects of the franchise, Captain Kirk being a womanizer, for example, this isn't really accurate. It's true that we don't see recognizable forms of our real-world religions being practiced by the characters in Star Trek. The relatively fleeting glimpses we get of Earth in the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th centuries don't show Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, or other major modern faiths being practiced or even talked about. And that was by design. Roddenberry wanted to show that humanity had evolved to a more enlightened state by the time his show took place, and that included not only conquering problems like racism, gender inequality, nationalistic conflicts, and poverty, but also growing beyond superstitious beliefs, including religion, and embracing science and reason. But that doesn't mean religion doesn't exist in the world we see depicted in Star Trek. A few years ago, I made a video about how the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode In the Hands of the Prophets models religious tolerance, and overall, Deep Space Nine is the Trek series that is the most interested in religion. We see the religious beliefs of alien cultures coming into play in many episodes throughout the franchise, and I'm going to talk about a few of those here in a bit, but only in Deep Space Nine do we get a sense that religious beliefs and practices are an important part of the everyday lives of some characters. These characters are all non-human. It's the Bajoran faith that gets paid the most attention in DS9. But, of course, this is Star Trek, so the Bajorans aren't really Bajorans. Like all the other alien species depicted in Star Trek, they represent aspects of us, of our culture and history. As Captain Kirk himself says to Spock in Star Trek VI, everybody's human. It's not an insult, Spock. He's acknowledging the allegorical aspect of the show. Don't they teach textual analysis in those Vulcan education pits? Through the Bajoran faith in the prophets, Deep Space Nine shows us that religious belief can be complex. We're shown how important the religion of the Bajorans is to them as a society, how it gave them the strength to fight back and persevere during the brutal decades-long occupation of their world by the Cardassians. We see how religious practice is an important part of the lives of characters who don't seem stereotypically religious. Kira, for example, who seems to have a very sincere and strongly held belief, but isn't what one would call... Um, pious. We meet heroic figures who are largely defined by their association with the Bajoran religion, including the wise and saintly Kaiopaka and Vedic Barail. I know he's not the most charismatic fellow in the galaxy, but at the very least, he doesn't seem like a bad guy. But we also meet Kai Wynn, the embodiment of malevolent self-interest. She is the opposite of Opaka and Barail, someone who uses her position as the leader of her world's foremost religious institution to protect and grow her own power, rather than to help her people or promote the values she claims to represent. Wynne stands for the dark side of religion, the side that seeks to use its influence to chain and subdue the faithful rather than enlighten and free them. She is Deep Space Nine's reminder that churches are just as vulnerable to corruption and just as capable of exploitation and abuse as secular institutions. Hopefully most viewers don't need such a reminder since we have more than enough real-life examples of that sort of thing, but, you know, it never hurts to make sure. 
Wynn isn't the only example of DS9 exploring religion's dark side. Late in the series, Gold Ducat starts a cult, which is not only completely in character for him, but also enables the show to explore how religious groups controlled by nefarious people can leverage not only the credulity, but also the desperation of their followers in order to press them into sometimes inescapable intellectual, emotional, and physical servitude. Let's also not forget about the Founders, the leaders of the Dominion, who not only cultivate a mysterious, all-powerful, godlike aura around themselves, but have also genetically engineered at least two species, the Vorta and the Jem'Hadar, to literally worship them as gods. In Deep Space Nine and throughout the rest of the franchise, there's one aspect of religion that pretty much every version of Star Trek seems to agree upon. Those who desire the worship of others are not to be trusted. Not that it requires a villainous vicar or a brazen bastard of a bishop in order for religion to damage people's lives. Sometimes all it takes is for ordinary people to internalize a harmful belief to the point they no longer question it. Star Trek shows us a few examples of that as well. The first one I want to examine comes from the fourth season of Deep Space Nine. It's an episode titled, A Session. A young Bajoran couple turns up at Sisko's office hoping to get the emissary's blessing for their marriage. So Sisko's like, sure, I'll bless you. Get your little buns over here, you crazy kids. Join hands, stand on one foot, and three, two, one, bless. Oblady, oblada, higgledy piggledy poo, shun the frumious bandersnatch, klatu barada nikto, go in peace. Good luck. The newlyweds are satisfied and they leave. Sisko turns to Dax like, you know, it's been a few years and I'm still not sure about this whole being a religious icon to an entire planet thing. It kind of gets in the way of my various administrative duties. While Dax is wondering whether or not Sisko's ambivalence toward his role as the emissary to the prophets will prove thematically relevant to this episode, Kira announces that something's coming through the wormhole. A 300-year-old Bajoran light ship. Hey, that's weird. Even weirder, aboard that ship is this guy, a Coram Lan. And get this, he says he's the emissary of the prophets. So what had happened was, a Coram Lan was out just taking a little run around the Denorius Belt when his ship was caught in a storm and he was seriously injured. Suddenly, he was pulled into the wormhole, or the Celestial Temple as the Bajorans call it, where he encountered the prophets. They healed his injury, let him hang out with them for what felt like a few days, and then chucked him back out into space. Except it wasn't a few days, it was 300 years, because the prophets exist outside linear time and just do not give a shit about it. But now, Akorum is back, and as far as he's concerned, he's still the emissary. So Sisko's like, works for me. Welcome back, your holiness. Anyway, those cargo manifests on my desk aren't gonna sign off on themselves. Gotta go. It looks like Sisko stepping aside and allowing Akorum to take over as the emissary is going to work out best for everyone. Until you realize that we're still in the first act, and this episode has got to be about something other than everyone getting along and being happy. What is this, TNG? That was a cheap shot. In TNG, everyone got along, but they weren't always happy. Especially when you know who was around. What? No. No. Not Q. I see how you got there, given the subject at hand, godlike being and all, but everybody loves Q. According to some of my fellow Trekkies, he's not even actually a villain, despite the number of times he endangers the lives of our heroes for his own amusement. Not sure how that's supposed to work, but whatever. You know who I mean when I say you know who. Come on. God damn it. Anyway... Akorem gives a speech on the station to all the Bajarans who have excitedly gathered to welcome the new emissary, who is actually the old emissary, but it was a long time ago, so none of them even remember. And Akorem is like, they told me about the Cardassian occupation. That sounds like it really sucked. So I think the best way for Bajor to heal its wounds and move on from that terrible experience is for us all to return to our rigid and arbitrary caste system. Thank you! See, it turns out that before the occupation, Bajoran society was organized according to predetermined social roles called Dajaras. Bajorans were born into a particular Dajara, and they pursued a particular way of life based on that. Some were born to be farmers, others artists, others priests, others... 
I don't know, what's another kind of job? Bank teller? Filling station attendant? There's probably a Dejara for basement finishing contractors. I don't know how specific they get. Anyway, when the Cardassians showed up, most Bajarans abandoned the Dejara system so they could become soldiers to fight back against the invaders. And after the Cardassians left, the Bajarans decided that they liked being able to decide for themselves what kind of job they wanted, and they never went back to the Dejaras. Akorum doesn't like that one bit. He thinks the people of Bajor should return to following the Dejaras right away. It's the will of the prophets. And if anybody knows what the will of the prophets is, it's Akorum. He's the emissary. He just saw the prophets. Like yesterday, they're pretty much his best friends. But Sisko's like, I'm the emissary too, and the prophets never said anything to me about no Dejaras. So he meets with Akorim and says, are you sure about this returning to a society based on arbitrary class discrimination thing? Because if Bajor reinstates its caste system, it's not going to be able to join the Federation. We frown on that sort of thing. It goes against Gene's vision. Who's Gene? Oh, just some guy. I think he wrote for Have Gun, Will Travel. The point is, going back to the Dejaras is a bad idea. That's just the attitude I'd expect from someone belonging to the always wrong about everything, Dejara. That's not... Why would that be a category? I have no idea, but it's not our place to question the prophets. Their ways are not our ways. Gotta go. Bye! Everyone turning their lives around to follow their Dejaras proves disruptive, to say the least, to Bajaran society and to life on the station. Kira's Dejara dictates that she should be an artist, so she tries her hand at sculpture and discovers, after much practice and effort, that she sucks at it. She shares her frustration with a Vedic who says, maybe it's all your fault and your faith just isn't strong enough? You're supposed to be an artist, but you're still wearing the uniform of a soldier. What we need to do is to get you out of that uniform. Excuse me? Oh, ha, no, no, I didn't mean it like that. Unless... Nope, nope. Gotta go now. And just to reiterate, nope. Kira tells Sisko she's resigning in order to move back to Bajor and become an artist's apprentice. That's not great news, but things get worse in short order when Odo calls Sisko to the promenade and Sisko arrives to find that a Bajaran monk has died after being pushed off the upper level. The person who pushed him is none other than Porta, the Vedic who was just trying to talk Kira into taking off her uniform in the totally non-sexual, changing her career sense. Sisko asks Porta what happened, and Porta explains that the monk belonged to a Dejara that is considered unclean. Therefore, Porta told the monk he should resign from their religious order. The monk refused, so Porta shoved him the hell over the railing. Gangsta. And wrong, also. Very wrong. By the way, I neglected to mention that Sisko has had a vision of Kai Opaka, who told him that he doesn't know himself. Dr. Bashir tells Sisko that it was what's called an orb shadow, which Bajarans believe happens to people who have had an orb experience but aren't following the path laid out for them by the prophets. So with that, and with the negative consequences of Bajor returning to its old caste system, and also, you know, this kindly priest becoming an unrepentant murderer, Sisko is starting to regret just handing over the title of emissary to this Akorum dipshit. Sisko summons a quorum to the station and says, I'm sorry I ever stepped down to let you be emissary. I want a shot at regaining the title. And a quorum says, but I already told you, ain't gonna be no rematch. They agree that having a public dispute over who is the true emissary would only make things worse on Bajor, so they fly into the wormhole to let the prophets decide. They take a runabout into the wormhole, they encounter the prophets, and the prophets are like, Oh, you guys, what's the point of dropping cryptic prophecies if you're just going to show up and ask us to clarify them? Look, tell the Bajarans not to go back to the Dajaras, okay? That's dumb. You wanted them to go back to the Dajaras? You're dumb. We kept you with us and then sent you back when we did so that the Cisco would realize that he truly is the emissary. There, are you happy? Sisko's like, I guess so. Thanks. Hey, now that this has been settled, can you just send this asshole back to his own time so we don't have to deal with any more of his bullshit? And the prophets are like, you got it. So Akoram returns to his own time. Sisko resumes being the emissary. The Bajarans abandon their Dajaras again. Kira doesn't resign her post to become an artist. Tiny Tim does not die. 
and everyone lives happily ever after. Until the next episode when Worf kills a bunch of civilians. Moving on. A session is an important episode for Sisko, obviously, as it shows him grappling with doubts about his role as the emissary and lets us see the pressures he deals with as he struggles to balance the expectations placed on him by that role with his responsibilities as a Starfleet officer. But it's also relevant to the subject of this video because it dramatizes what can happen when a large group of people blindly follows an edict handed down by what they regard as an unquestionable authority. Authority. The Bajarans believe that Akorim speaks for the prophets, that he knows their will, so when he tells them to return to their Dajaras, they do it. And when Porta sees a monk who refuses to get with the program, he kills him and feels justified in doing so by his faith. It's the will of the prophets! This is religion at its most toxic. This is the harm unquestioned religious faith can enable. And to be fair, it's not just religion that can do this. There are certainly secular ideologies that leave their adherents feeling entitled to persecute, subjugate, and even kill other people. But religious forms of these ideologies are often the most powerful and compelling because they claim a divine mandate. They exist not just to tell you what to do, but to tell you what you're supposed to do because it's what God, or in this case the prophets, want you to do. I think it's important that this happens within the Bajoran religion, which is usually depicted in a positive light, and that it's the result of Akorim's sincere belief. He's not depicted as a bad faith actor at all. He truly believes that by calling for a return to the Dajaras, he's doing what's best for Bajor. He's not the malignant figure that Kai Wen is. He's earnest, but misguided, which in the wrong circumstance can be just as dangerous. The Bajaran faith isn't the only religion we see depicted in Deep Space Nine. We also get occasional glimpses into the Ferengi spiritual life, which revolves just as much around acquisition and ostentatious displays of wealth as does Ferengi life in this mortal coil. The Ferengi afterlife is imagined as a divine treasury made of pure latinum, presided over by a blessed exchequer who determines how profitable a Ferengi's life has been, and a celestial auctioneer who allows successful Ferengi to bid on new lives. The Ferengi version of Hell is the vault of eternal destitution, the fearful destination of the souls of Ferengi who fail to turn a profit during their lifetimes. Ferengi religion is mostly an extension of the satire of capitalism that shapes what we see of Ferengi society, but it also works as a commentary on how we sometimes, okay, quite often, use religion not to call ourselves to a higher, better way of life, but to sanctify what we're already doing. You think I'm greedy and selfish? Well, I'll have you know that's how God wants me to be. And I know this because I learned it through my religious tradition, which was started by people who were just as greedy and selfish as me, only they did it a long time ago and before anyone knew what was going on. So you can't prove God wasn't in there somewhere doing something. Anyway, the point is, don't talk to me or my money ever again. One of the other ways religious faith can be harmful to a society and act as an obstacle to progress is by teaching people to be satisfied in their ignorance. This idea is explored in one of my favorite religious-themed Trek episodes, a show from Star Trek The Next Generation's third season titled Who Watches the Watchers? The Enterprise arrives at Mentaka 3 to assist a team of anthropologists who have been observing the natives from behind a holographically camouflaged duck blind. The duck blind's reactor is failed and the battery backup is running out and... Actually, by the time the Enterprise gets there, it has run out, and the hologram that hides the facility from view has disappeared. Before Geordi can get the hologram back on, a pair of Mintakins, Liko and his daughter Oji, spot this mysterious window in the side of the cliff, and Liko climbs up to investigate. He looks through the window to see the Starfleet crew, then he touches the frame of the window and gets shocked because it's electrically charged for some reason. He falls off the cliff. Dr. Crusher runs down to help him and has him beamed up to sickbay. Hiding nearby, O.G. watches as her father and this weirdo magic lady vanish into thin air. Aboard the Enterprise, Crusher is in sickbay tending to the injured Liko when Picard walks in and is like, so why didn't you just let him die? 
And Crusher is like, damn, why do you get, like, randomly dogmatic about the Prime Directive? Because half the time, it's like you don't even care about it, and the other half, you're like, they've seen us kill everyone. Don't be silly, I don't want to kill everyone. Just this guy. Because he's seen us. While Crusher and Picard argue, we cut to Liko's perspective. He's groggy, and he doesn't understand most of what they're saying, but he recognizes that Picard is in charge and seems to be making life-and-death decisions. Crusher decides to erase Liko's memory of his encounter with Starfleet and beam him back home, but because of Liko's brain chemistry or something, the memory wipe doesn't take, and when he wakes up on Mentaka 3, he remembers everything. Oji finds him, and he tells her what happened. He was taken to an incredible place where his wounds were healed by beings who held great power. He tells Oji that he thinks these beings are the gods their ancestors used to believe in, the ones responsible for the rains and the sunrise, the ones who controlled life and death. Oji's like, but those are Stone Age superstitions. We no longer believe such things here in the sophisticated and enlightened Bronze Age. Liko's like, well, then how do you explain what just happened to me, dude? No, no, it was definitely some ancient gods or something who healed me, and I'm gonna tell everybody. Back on the Enterprise, they don't know that Liko's memory wipe didn't work, but they've got another problem. One of the researchers from the duck blind went missing after the shit went down, and they can't locate him. Worried about cultural contamination, Picard has Riker and Troy disguise themselves as Mentakins and beam back down to look for the missing researcher, whose name is Palmer. Riker and Troy, in their Mentakin costumes, drop in on a town meeting where Liko is telling everybody about how he was brought back to life by the all-powerful god being called the Picard. Riker's like, uh-oh. Hoping to quell the rapidly rising tide of Picard worship, Troy steps forward, announces herself and Riker as visitors from another village, and tries to talk some sense into these shithead yokels. She tells Liko, maybe what you had was a dream, and maybe your daughter saw you and one of these mysterious visitors disappear because she was also having a dream. Liko's like, that doesn't sound reasonable. And Riker's like, oh, but being magically transported to the astral plane to be healed by an omnipotent bald Frenchman is super reasonable, right? Which, I mean, <laughs> it's actually not that unreasonable, given the fact that they live in a Star Trek show, but whatever, he's got a job to do, I get it. Unfortunately for Riker and Troy, right at that moment, a couple of Mentakins come walking in carrying Palmer. Right away, Liko is like, this must be the missing dude I heard the Picard mention while I was in heaven or whatever. I bet he's a servant of the Picard or something. We should keep him safe until the Picard comes back for him, and the Picard will be so pleased by our faithfulness that I bet he'll totally do us a solid because he's cool like that. Everyone else is like, sounds good to us. Hail the Picard! Troy sees everything going south in a hurry, so she thinks fast, steps forward, and says, hey, oh my god, you guys, you won't believe this. I mean, recent evidence suggests you probably will, actually. But anyway, I just saw another one like Palmer outside. He was heading toward the caves. Let's go get him. And while everyone else runs outside with Troy, Riker grabs Palmer and makes a run for it. Although Riker is able to get out of sight and beam back to the Enterprise with Palmer, OG sees him escaping and tells the others, and they immediately take Troy prisoner. Picard doesn't want to just beam Troy up because she's surrounded by Mentakins, and using the transporter will only make the cultural contamination worse. I mean, <laughs> I think we've crossed that bridge, but okay, sometimes logic takes a backseat to drama. I get it. With Troy's life possibly in danger, Picard consults Baron, the lead researcher from the Duckblind. Baron says, look, like it or not, the Mentakins think you're a god, so if we want to guarantee that Troy comes home safe and also make sure this culture develops in a positive direction, you should just go down there, be the Picard they think you are, and give them some healthy rules to live by or something. Picard's like, um, no? Look, your own research indicates that these people used to be superstitious, but eventually they grew beyond that and have built their society around science and reason instead. And now you want me to just go down there, validate their false beliefs, and send them back into the Dark Ages? Not me, son. Johnny don't play that. Picard decides to take a drastic step, though not as drastic as declaring himself a god. Since the Mentakins have become convinced that he is a god, he's going to prove to them that he's not. 
To do this, he plans to beam one of them aboard the Enterprise. No, not that doofus Liko. Her. Nuria. She's sensible and has the respect of the others. If Picard can convince her that he's not a god, maybe the cultural contamination can at least be limited. They wait until Nuria is alone, then beam her up. Picard meets her in the transporter room, and she's like, Oh, hey, the Picard! Our new religion is true! Let me worship you there, guy! Picard says, No, don't worship me. I don't deserve it. I'm not a god. I'm flesh and blood, just like you. Also, not to muddy the water, but I've met actual gods, and they don't deserve to be worshipped either. Just for future reference. Picard takes Nuria on a tour of the Enterprise. He tries to explain to her how things work. The automatic doors aren't magic, they're just mechanical in a way she's never encountered before. What Nuria interprets as godlike powers are just the results of advanced technology. And if the Mentakans continue to grow and develop as a people, someday, many generations from now, they could reach the same level of technology and travel among the stars just like Picard and his crewmates do. Nuria seems to be digging what Picard is laying down at first, but she's like, This is all great, thanks for the tour, but now can you bring some of our dead people back to life? So, a little bit of a setback, but Picard gets a call from Dr. Crusher, who informs him that one of the injured researchers from the duck blind is about to die. Picard's like, Oh, great, I can use that, and he drags Nuria with him to sickbay. They arrive just in time to witness the death of Warren, the injured researcher, and when it's over, Nuria turns to Picard and says, I get it now. You're far more advanced than we are, but you're not gods. You're just people, the same as we are. Picard's like, fucking finally, yes, thank you. I sure am glad I had a scientist lying around on her deathbed. Otherwise, I guess I would have had to try and convince you by resorting to Plan B, spacing Wesley. Did you need me for something, Captain? No, you're off the hook. To the surface! Meanwhile, at the meeting hall, Liko has decided that it's the Picard's will to punish Troy for the abduction of Palmer, so he's about to shoot her with a bow and arrow, as you do, when Picard and Nuria run in, and Picard's like, whoa, no shooty the lady, okay, buddy? Liko's like, it's the Picard! God in the house! Picard tries to explain for like the third time in the past few hours, ever have one of those days that he's not a god? He's just a normal person, he doesn't have any supernatural powers, and he can't bring people back from the dead. And Liko's like, can too? Watch, I'll prove it by killing you, so you have to bring yourself back to life. That'll convince everybody, including you. Who then will be the doofus, my friend? Who then? Picard says, all right, fine, you know what? Apparently witnessing death is the only thing that convinces you people of anything, so if you're so sure that I'm a god, go ahead and shoot me. You'll kill me, and you'll see that I'm telling the truth about not being a god. Or you could just believe me and Nuria, who can back up everything I'm saying, and not kill anyone. Liko's like, got it, I'll take option A, and he fires the arrow. The arrow hits Picard in the shoulder, he drops, Nuria checks on him and comes up with a hand covered in his blood. Liko's like, I killed God! Oh man, I'm gonna be in so much trouble for this! Luckily, the arrow only does minor damage, and Crusher is able to fix Picard right up. Plus, Picard's injury has convinced the ignorant and bloodthirsty Mintakins that he isn't a god after all. And finally, the duck blind is being removed from Mintaka 3 to allow the people to live and develop in peace, free from further interference. So it's wins all around! Another successful mission by the brave crew of the Starship Enterprise, except for the many ways in which they cocked it up. This episode, and particularly Picard's angry rebuke of Baron's suggestion that they play along with the Mentakans' new religious beliefs and try to guide their society in a positive direction, is often cited as an example of Star Trek's overall attitude toward religion. Picard equates belief in the supernatural with superstition, ignorance, and fear. And I certainly have no problem with that personally. I'm an atheist, and I don't really regard belief in a god, any god or gods, as any more credible than, say, belief in ghosts or fairies or astrology. 
Also, let's remember that Who Watches the Watchers premiered four months after the release of the film Star Trek V The Final Frontier, at the climax of which Captain Kirk confronts an incredibly impressive and powerful being at the center of the galaxy who seems awfully godlike to everyone else, listens to this possible god demand that the Starship Enterprise be placed into his service, and responds with, Excuse me, I just have one question. What does God need with a starship? It's maybe the quintessential Captain Kirk moment for me. Who is Captain Kirk? What makes him special? If you can boil it down to a single moment, it's this one, where he's face to face with a being who could very well be God. And instead of bowing down, he raises his hand and says, Ah, hold on a second. From that, and from Picard's statements in Who Watches the Watchers, we can reasonably conclude that in Star Trek, skepticism and fearless curiosity, even in the face of divinity, perhaps especially in the face of divinity, are heroic traits. A hero doesn't worship. A hero doesn't blindly serve an unaccountable authority, no matter how powerful. A hero thinks, asks questions, looks for answers, and acts accordingly. But that doesn't mean that Star Trek is anti-religion. Much like religious beliefs themselves, Star Trek's attitude toward religion is complicated. And I'm not just talking about the way it's depicted through the Bajorans in Deep Space Nine. Let's take another look at Captain Picard. In Who Watches the Watchers, he seems to denounce belief in the supernatural altogether. But a year earlier, in the episode Where Silence Has Lease, he articulates a much more complex attitude. The Enterprise has fallen under the control of Nigilum, a godlike being who has just learned about the whole mortality thing and has been conducting experiments on the Enterprise crew to learn about it. And by experiments, I mean killing random people to see what happens. In response to this, Picard has decided to activate the Enterprise's self-destruct mechanism, because if anybody's going to kill the crew of the Enterprise, it's going to be the captain. That's the Starfleet way. So while Picard is sitting in his quarters, rocking out to an Eric Satie piano jam, he gets a visit from Data and Troy. And it turns out to not really be Data and Troy, just Nagilam running a game on Picard. That's not relevant to this discussion, but I know if I don't acknowledge it, some nerd's going to leave a comment about it. So just relax, nerd. I've seen the episode. I know it's not the real Data who asks Picard about death. Anyway, not the real Data asks Picard about death. Specifically, what is it? And Picard sketches out the two most common beliefs about what death is and what happens after you die. Some people, he explains, believe that after you die, you enter into an eternal afterlife, where you exist in an indestructible form and live in an idyllic setting forever. Others believe that when we die, we cease to exist, that our consciousness, our personality, our thoughts, feelings, memories, all blink into nothingness. But when Data asks what Picard believes, Picard says that he doesn't find either of those possibilities satisfying, that he thinks the true nature of our existence must be beyond either of those two beliefs, beyond the limitations of what we currently understand as reality. It's important to recognize that Picard's statement in Where Silence Has Lease and his harsh skepticism of the supernatural in Who Watches the Watchers do not contradict each other. It's not a case of inconsistent characterization of the writers deciding to make Picard into a different kind of character. A rejection of the supernatural, particularly of the claims regarding how the supernatural supposedly manifests itself, is fully compatible with a belief in some kind of higher meaning, higher purpose, higher reality. I don't personally have such a belief. I'm a pretty straightforward meat and potatoes atheist. I believe the physical universe is all that there is. There is no such thing as the supernatural. There are no gods or angels or demons or ghosts or anything else like that. And when you die, you die, and that's the end. I'm not happy about it. I'd love it if there was such a thing as eternal life, but I see no evidence for it, no reason to believe it exists, no reason to regard such a belief as anything but wishful thinking. But you can still believe in the sort of 
transcendent ultimate reality Picard proposes in Where Silence Has Lease and reject superstition and the supernatural. We reject belief in those things because there is no evidence, because claims of supernatural occurrences have all either remained unsubstantiated or been shown false. But Picard's belief in a reality beyond our understanding isn't based on specific claims or evidence. It's based on the idea that the true nature of our existence is beyond our ability to measure it or reduce it to rational principles. It's a belief that seems to be based on a kind of intuition rooted in an awareness of the awesomeness of the universe. Again, that's not enough of a reason for me to hold such a belief, but it doesn't contradict a rejection of supernatural phenomena for which there is no compelling evidence. And I think Picard's philosophy, hard scientific skepticism that leaves room for higher levels of reality that exist in spaces beyond our understanding, is pretty close to Star Trek's overall attitude toward religion. When you've watched enough Star Trek, and not to brag, but I've watched all of it, you get the message that religion is not inherently good or bad, but that it depends on the specific religious belief or practice or person. There are plenty of examples of the bad. In the classic Trek episode, The Apple, Vol, the god worshipped by the inhabitants of Gamma Trianguli 6, turns out to be a computer and when Kirk destroys it, this act is presented as a good thing, freeing the people from a life in servitude to a machine, though the people themselves don't really seem to see it that way. In the TNG episode Devils Do, a con artist exploits the religious beliefs of the people of the planet Ventax, disguising herself as Ardra, a mythical figure from their ancient history who promised to return one day. The Ventaxian faith in Ardra is so strong and so unquestioned that, if not for the involvement of Captain Picard and crew, the phony Ardra would probably have succeeded in installing herself as ruler of the planet. The Voyager episode False Prophets has a similar premise, as a pair of Ferengi stranded in the Delta Quadrant are found to have exploited the religious beliefs of the inhabitants of a less advanced planet in order to set themselves up as holy sages, living in luxurious comfort while the common people work to serve them. In Star Trek Discovery, we see how Saru's species, the Kelpians, have been subjugated by the Ba'ul, who have given the enslavement of the Kelpians a decidedly religious character, inculcating them with the belief that their ritual sacrifices were a sacred part of maintaining the balance of their planet. Only after Saru discovers that one of the central teachings of this faith is false are the Kelpians able to throw off generations of religious indoctrination, rise up against their oppressors, and claim their freedom. And there are other examples of religion being depicted in a negative light, but we also see the positive side. The Bajarans aren't the only religious people we meet in Star Trek. Klingons also practice a religion and even have something equivalent to a Christ figure in the form of Kalos, though they don't have gods because, as Worf explains, ancient Klingons decided their gods were too much trouble and killed them. And even those models of logic and reason the Vulcans seem to have a deeply spiritual side. When we visit Vulcan for the first time in the classic Trek episode Amok Time, we witness the Vulcan marriage ceremony, which is steeped in ancient tradition. In Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, we learn that Vulcans believe in an immortal soul called the Katra, which has the advantage of actually existing, so of course the Vulcans would believe in it. It's only logical. And throughout the franchise, we see Spock, as well as other Vulcan characters like Tuvok and T'Pol, practicing rituals that have a decidedly religious feel to them. Of course, when we're analyzing the depiction of religion in Star Trek, we need to make allowances for the fact that many in-universe religious beliefs are based on real, verifiable things. As I just said, the Vulcan Katra isn't just an article of faith, it actually exists, and there's evidence to demonstrate that. And while it's a matter of interpretation whether or not they are gods, the beings worshipped by the Bajarans as the prophets do definitely exist, and are capable of doing some extraordinary things. 
And there are other beings in the Star Trek universe, most notably the members of the Q Continuum, who appear to be essentially omnipotent, which would certainly qualify them as gods under many traditional definitions of that term. So, for the purposes of this video, I think it's important to view the religious beliefs of Star Trek characters in less literal terms. Yes, the Bajaran faith is different from real-world human religions in the sense that the gods of the Bajarans actually exist, but the religion of the Bajarans and other forms of religion depicted in Star Trek are still used to represent human religions. And when we're trying to decide what Star Trek is actually saying about religion, we should consider them on that basis. And what does Star Trek actually say about religion? Well, as I hope I've made clear by now, lots of stuff. It says that growing beyond the widespread practice of religion can be a mark of societal advancement, but it also says that more than just rejecting religion is necessary to cure society's ills. It equates religious faith with superstition, fairly in my opinion, but it also points out, also fairly, that one can have a sincere and deeply held religious faith and still be an intelligent and rational person. It argues that wonder and openness to the possibilities of what could lie in those vast realms of reality that exist beyond our understanding are good things, but that worship and the desire to be worshipped definitely aren't. It says that religious belief can be a weakness, can make us credulous, leave us vulnerable to manipulation and exploitation, divide us, convince us that blissful ignorance is preferable to challenging knowledge, but it also says that religion can be a source of strength, unite us in a common cause, and call us to be our higher, better selves. Perhaps most importantly, it says, or rather shows, that though religion is not a part of every individual's life, and shouldn't have to be, it is, and probably always will be, a part of the common life we all share together on this planet. In all its many varieties, for good and for bad, as a wellspring of hope and a catalyst of destruction, religion is a part of human experience. And if we truly want to honor the concept of infinite diversity and infinite combinations, we need to respect each other's right to believe or not believe as we see fit. And we also need to know when it's time to put down the sacred text and pick up the tricorder. So to speak, we don't actually have tricorders yet. Although really, Smartphones are starting to come awfully close. I've got mine attached to the teleprompter at the moment, so I can't show it to you, but it's paired with my smartwatch here, and it tracks my vital signs and everything. Like right now, according to these readings, I am dead. Huh. I mean, even tricorders make mistakes. Or do they? Turns out I'm not dead. I just didn't have my watch on tight enough. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Catherine Bazzoni, thank you Catherine. Ken Ferris, thank you Ken. Jeremy, thank you Jeremy. Keith Shields. Thank you, Keith. Next up, new channel members, and they are Mike D. Thank you, Mike. And Snowflake990. Thank you, Snowflake990. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up, or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out 
at the end of a Trek Actually video. I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members. So to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. And once again, if you want to help out, please go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects. The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low ranking Starfleet officers. We are into our fourth season now and our characters have jumped from the TOS era to the TNG era. Our show is a lot of fun to make, and judging by most of the comments we get, it's a lot of fun to listen to as well. If you're not listening, the links are in the description of this video. Please do check out the Ensign's Log. I think you'll really dig it. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and another series, or sometimes a movie, that I have never seen before. We're into season two of DS9. We started out watching Firefly on the off weeks from DS9. Now we're watching the Netflix original animated series Hilda. So whenever you're able to join us, we invite you to queue up whatever we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Next month's Trek Actually topic, as chosen by my patrons and members, was a bit of a surprise winner on the last poll. Not that I'm complaining. It's a good topic. I mean, I came up with it. Of course, it's good. I just didn't expect there to be so much interest in this one right away. And yet, in its first time as an option in the poll, this topic easily won, taking the final round of voting with a whopping 54%. And that topic is, is Star Trek actually any good at comedy? Opinions vary. <laughs> That's next month. Should be a fun video. I hope you'll join me. Until next time, thanks for watching. And take care, everybody.